Hi, right, welcome back to class. Uh, in, in today's lecture, I want to give an introduction, lay out some frameworks to help us as we continue to move through the course textbooks and as you engage other uh, material for our course together this term. Um, when we talk about uh, beginnings of the class, uh, I want to give you some assumptions that I make about uh, why you're here, why I'm here, why we're here together. And one of the first things that I want to remind us is that I want us to be in a covenant of prayer with each other for this whole semester. So let's let's pray for each other. When you open up the class, uh, say a quick prayer for your colleagues, for me, uh, and let us lift up each family represented, each person here, and each community of faith and community that and in general that we live in in prayer. Uh, the second thing is I'm I'm assuming that each one of us is here to learn and grow into the person that God created each one of us to be, that we're here to, to be pushed uh, and to become better than we are uh, now. I also don't think there's any dichotomy or tension or separation between a serious study of the scriptures, even a critical study of the scripture, and a fully committed, sold out of faith in Jesus Christ. And so in this class, you can ask any question that you want to. Uh, you can be as skeptical as you want to be, but we're going to approach these, this piece in, an, in, in a context of faith. So what I mean by skeptical, ask the hard question that you've always pondered about the Bible that maybe you're afraid to ask in any other church. You know, In the seminary classroom, or at least the way I'm going to teach, there's no question it's off limit, no matter how skeptical it can, can sound, because I, I ask hard questions myself. It's how I've always grown. It's about faith seeking understanding. And critical study can help us to answer those questions that might actually help another person who's struggling to take that step of faith. So don't worry about... Um, thinking there's some kind of difference between being fully engaged academically and fully engaged spiritually. Let's hold those things together in, in, a, in, in, the, in a dynamic tension, which is what Wesleyan theology is ultimately about anyway. Also, in that context, here at Asbury, we're committed to the authority of Scripture. Uh, here's the catalog statement from Asbury, uh, from our doctrinal statement, and this is what it says about the Scriptures. In the, in, we believe in the divine inspiration, truthfulness, and authority of both the Old and New Testaments, the only written word of God without error in all it affirms. The scriptures are the only infallible rule of faith and practice. The Holy Spirit preserves God's word in the church today, and by it speaks God's truth to people of every age. Uh, the key phrase here is right here, without error in all it affirms. Notice that this is a very high view of Scripture that still assumes the necessity of interpretation. Because that's what without error and all it affirms means. It's, it means the Scriptures are the Word of God and what they say are true, but we need to make sure that what we say the Bible says is what it's actually saying. Uh, thus, the need for courses like this and focused attention to the process of careful, wise, interpretation of the scriptures. I also assume that we're all committed to holiness of heart and life. If you're not familiar with that phrase, that's the phrase that John Wesley used to talk about holiness or entire sanctification. Uh, the idea that we can become, again, that man, that woman that God was dreaming about when he first created us. So I, I believe the Bible has an optimistic message about what God can do in us through the power of the Spirit. The Spirit wants to transform us. So part of this class is going to be reflecting some on, on that element as it comes out of a study of the Scriptures. I also assume, and this came out in our opening uh, videos, is in a commitment to mission as the reason for the existence of the church in the world. We're God's hands, God's feet, God's mouthpieces. Uh, the gospel comes to us on its way to someone else. That's what uh, my friend Alex McManus likes to say. He also has this really hard saying, the Western world's lost its faith in the shadow of church steeples. So I'm, wherever you are, you can find churches where almost no one attends. Maybe that's the church that even you've been part of at some point. The Western world, with, despite all of its churches, all its Christians, 
faith is decreasing in our age. As I said in one of the opening videos, 5,000 less Christians every single day. So what does it take to reverse that? I want to suggest that it, it takes a generation rising up uh, it, that's hungry for God, that's equipped and ready to spread scriptural holiness across the land again. So one of the questions that I want us to work through in this class and this is an introduction to Old Testament class, but this is still a class that's ultimately about mission, because it's always about mission. What's the relationship between holiness, the study of Scripture, and mission? I want us to think about that. Uh, let me show you one of my favorite pictures. In fact, this next slide, if you get this, uh, you, will have, uh, you will have learned the key lesson of the semester already. Take a look at this. What do your eyes tell you? What do you see? We look carefully at it. You know, how many legs does this thing have? What do we have here? What is this? And what I want to suggest, this is an artifact from, uh, from the Assyrian time. This is, there were two of these, and they would have guarded the entrance to the throne room of the king of Assyria. And notice how menacing these things look like. These are huge. You have this lion body. You have the Assyrian's king's head on it, with a, and he has a, a eagle's wings. So, you know, did, did, did people in the ancient world believe in these things? Uh, perspective matters. In particular, I want to ask you how many legs are on this. And I want you to pause the video for a second and ponder that. All right, thanks for taking a minute to take a look at this. You know, how many legs are there? Notice if you look, if you count them from this angle, and I want to suggest to you this is exactly the wrong angle to look at this picture because it looks like there's multiple legs here, way more than four, right? And the reason is this is designed, this is not a statue in the round, uh, this is designed to be looked at dead straight on and then directly from the side at a 90 degree angle. We're looking at it at a 45 degree angle, so we're seeing it from the wrong perspective. And what I want you to remember about this picture is when we read the Bible, even if it, you, it looks like we can understand what the words mean, we always need to remember that the Bible comes to us from the ancient world, and they did things differently there. They had some different ways of expressing thoughts that may not directly one-to-one -one translate to us today. So we need to remember that when we read the scriptures, we need to gain the right perspective so that we hear what God is saying, not just to them, in the past, but so that we can hear what God wants to say to the 21st century world through these ancient texts. Now let me share with you a couple of my favorite uh, quotations about scriptures. This comes from a Jewish context. I just want to have a sense of the, the culture that gave us the Old Testament. Um, part of it morphed into Judaism, obviously, and then the, we also have a stream that turned into the Christian gospel, but this comes from the Jewish side of things, and listen to some of these quotes from, from the, this is from the Mishnah, talking about the Torah, the, the law of Moses, study it, study it, for everything is in it, examine it diligently until you're worn out with age by it, and do not be distracted from it, you could have no better measure than it. That's one of my prayers for all of us. Well, this one from the Babylonian Talmud, Scripture speaks in the language of human beings. That's that incarnational principle that you're going to hear about in Peter Inns' book. The, the Word of God actually comes into our human culture so that we hear God's words, in, well, in the Bible's case, in the language of the ancient world. What would it look like for us to get good enough at interpreting Scripture that when we interpret through teaching or preaching or counseling or whatever our calling is, is that people can hear the power of the Scriptures in their own language. Scripture speaks in the language of human beings. Let's learn to speak human. What is Scripture? It's the exposition of Scripture. No, this isn't something from Forrest Gump that we don't quite get, right? It's like, what's that mean? Stupid is as stupid does. Uh, what is Scripture? It's the exposition of Scripture. What is this affirming? It's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's affirming to us that, yeah, we have the Bible, we have God's Word, but ultimately that Word needs to be exposited, explained, interpreted. And this quote captures that. What's the goal of biblical interpretation then? I want to suggest to you that it's simply this. It's conversion. The Bible wants to invite us not to find a, uh, not to find a place in our lives for it, 
but the Bible wants to pull us into its story so that the biblical story becomes our story. And as we learn to be dynamic and powerful and profound and confident interpreters of Scripture, we need to make sure that we're the first ones to convert to that word. Every single time we want to continually realign with what God's saying in Scripture so that we can then invite other people to align or realign with us as we set the example for that. So don't ever forget, we read the Bible for transformation with the assumption that none of us are quite there yet. Um, some of my favorite quotations, this is from Brian McClare, one of his early books uh, on evangelism, just to kind of remind us of the attitude that we need for reading scripture and the perspective. He wrote, it's hard for us, spoiled as we are by being marketing targets, but the Bible asks us to rise above our narrow parochial tastes. It asks us to learn, to understand, to imaginatively enter an alien geography, Nineveh, Jerusalem, Bethany, Bethlehem, alien economies with Denari talents, shekels, alien cultures, social structures, polygamy, patriarchy, monarchy, tribal confederation, slavery, arranged marriages. It asks us to stop absolutizing our perspective and instead see our modern or postmodern viewpoints simply as views from a point, limited, contingent, changing, not privileged. In so doing, the very form of the Bible begins teaching us something about humility and perspective. My Old Testament teacher, who still teaches at Asbury Lawson Stone, uh, reminded us that in a sense, when we read the Bible, the process of learning to read the Bible well is actually training for cross-cultural conversation about, with the, about the Bible with other people. So the very process of learning to read the Bible carefully trains us then to communicate it to other people because we have to enter the world, world of the Bible if we're going to learn to read the Bible. We're going to need to enter the world of others if we're going to need, learn to share the gospel with them. Uh, let me give you one final quotation. This is my, one of my favorite novels is East of Eden from John Steinbeck. And he tells of a, a character named Liza Hamilton. She's uh, sort of the main matriarch on the uh, so-called good side of the family in this particular book. And Steinbeck has an interesting observation about her. She was the family Christian, and she always read the Bible. And he wrote this about her method. He wrote of Liza, her total intellectual association was the Bible. Except the talk of Samuel and her children, and to them she did not listen. In that one book, she had her history and her poetry, her knowledge of peoples and things, her ethics, her morals, and her salvation. She never studied the Bible or inspected it. She just read it. The many places where it seems to refute itself did not confuse her in the least. And finally, she came to a point where she knew it so well that she went right on reading it without listening. I've added the italics there at the end, that she went right on reading it without listening. Uh, friends, uh, biblical interpretation is, is serious business. The Bible is God's gift to the world. God wants to be known, so God's given us a book. Uh, my prayer for each of us as we journey through the Old Testament scriptures together in this class is that God would astonish us anew with the richness of his word and breathe fresh life into it so we can read it for a lifetime, listening to it attentively and allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and shape and form us into the kind of people that we need to become for the sake of God's mission in the world. Uh, thank you very much. Live by faith, be known by love, and be a voice of hope for the world. Amen.